Welcome back. This is Professor Emily Seal here to do our final lecture on persuasion. We'll be starting on page 207 in your book with a picture of Michael J. Fox there. So as we've already discussed in previous chapters, persuasion is perhaps the most important and the most common of public speaking challenges. In your tribute speech, you've already had an opportunity to persuade your audience, and we're inundated with persuasion in a capitalistic society. It's so funny because my son is used to um, streaming services that don't have advertisements in them and he gets so frustrated when he has to wait for a commercial when he's watching one of his favorite shows which is currently Paw Patrol uh, yeah he loves dogs but um I have to say I have a little bit of that same tendency that my son does uh, frustration with advertisements we're inundated with them we're saturated with um, people trying to sell us stuff um, and so me talking to you about persuasion, I know this is something that you live and you see and you're probably awake to the fact that advertisements are all around you. I also know a lot of you come at this lecture having already studied some of this content in English, hopefully. So um, I will touch on things briefly. Once again, one of the frustrations with mass media, I'm not there to see your face to see if you have heard of this before, but we'll take a, a jump of faith and say that you're familiar with advertising in general, and you're also familiar with some of these logical fallacies we'll talk about today, which you probably heard about in your English class. I said this when I talked about research, but I'll say it again. The key to persuasion is good data, that you have done your homework, that you've sat down and studied and you found credible research. And that's one thing that is different from an advertisement. And, and you are trying to give us the gift of a discerning um, set of research. Right? You're giving us the gift of saying, hey, I've really dug deep into this. This is why you should recycle. I've really dug deep. Ooh, uh -oh. uh, I've dug deep here. This is why you need to um, go to the gym every day. When you have done your research and you are familiar with your data, you're helping us to become discerning people and make wise decisions. So it's about um, a deeper than just trying to sell us a used car, hopefully. Um, that's not what you're going to be doing in class. And I, I'll start with a bit of ethos here. Um, this is my father. About six or seven years ago, he had his first stroke. And um, he was put into ICU for months and months and then was put into a rehabilitation facility. He had lost um, a lot of the use of the left side of his body as a after effect of the stroke and like most people who've gone through something that um, traumatic he was in a deep depression and um, you know we all that's my sister there um, my sister and I tried to talk to him tried to persuade him tried to help him um, but we really weren't speaking his language until he was placed in a facility called Adams Place and he had a occupational therapist. I'll never forget his name. His name was Bill. And he was a former football player, like my dad. My dad played for the state of Alabama, um, you know, back when Bear Bryant. And uh, he, football's a big part of my dad's life. And because they both spoke that football language, because they both had trained on a field, Bill was able to talk to my dad in a way that he understood. And, um, after only a few months with Bill, he was willing to take these risks. He was willing to stand um, with the aid of a walker. He was willing to get up out of bed. And I will never um, be able to thank Bill enough for the difference that he made in my dad's life. My dad was actually able to go back to full-time ministry. He's now retired, but um, he got five more years in the pulpit doing what he loved because of Bill. So um, persuasion is not only something that happens to us uh, in a capitalistic society, it's also something that happens between meaningful relationships. Maybe you're trying to persuade um, your toddler to put on pants this morning like I was. Uh, maybe you're trying to persuade yourself to make a better decisions, to stay on your diet, to study for your exam. Persuasion is something um, that is part of the everyday life and it can be very meaningful. So sometimes we're trying to persuade someone to do something they already want to do, 
right? My son this morning did not want to put on pants, right? He was completely opposed to pants. So on the far left side, you can see there, he would have been strongly triple negative opposed to putting on his pants, right? When Bill persuaded my father to get up out of bed, he was coming at this grumpy old man, I, love, I said, in love for my father, someone who was strongly opposed. When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke into a camera and said, I have a dream, he knew the people behind that camera, many of them, were strongly opposed. You know, they were in favor of Jim Crow laws. They were in favor of continuing to have the systematic oppression of people in order for capital gain. Um, we go into situations, um, you know, I had an 8 a.m. class last year that was just strongly opposed <laughs> to, to um, uh, their curriculum. And we go in front of those audiences, and those are our tough crowd, right? We have a tough crowd. If you're um, a people pleaser, if you think that um, you are emotionally not ready for that sort of combat, you may want to think about the topic choices that you come at. You know, we, uh, by this time in the semester, we know each other. We know people's strong opinions. We've had these conversations in class. If you don't know how your audience feels about your topic, then take the time in class to talk about it. And we will um, do a informal survey or a formal survey and say, how do you feel about testing on the high school level? How do you feel about um, the your audience out about it but you need to be looking for that feedback just like we talked about in chapter one you need to be watching their faces watching are they checking out do I need to stick tape a, take a step back are they um, is this going right over their head do I need to how can I meet them where they are so sometimes you're completely changing someone's mind right um, you go into a situation you know they think one way maybe they are a um, Buddhist and you want them to be a Christian that's a conversion that's a complete opposition that's the most difficult so maybe someone is not even aware of a problem one of the best speeches I ever had from a student was talking about using um, bottled water and how damaging that was to the environment and I was drinking bottled water at the time. I had a bottled water sitting right there in front of me. And even though I kind of had heard that somewhere, you know, I, I hadn't really taken the time to think about the impact of my actions. And so that was really an easy time for them to persuade me. I had never even thought about it. So I stopped using bottled water. Another great example of an instill speech I heard from a student was about eggs and how we should you know, think about using cage-free eggs, um, chickens who were allowed to run free or had plenty of space um, and weren't incubated in these tight conditions. Um, I was really kind of unaware of that issue, even having grown up in Cowan around all of these chicken houses and things, um, but I was unaware. Easily were able to change my mind. And um, the example that I gave you, you can see there the outline of the persuasive speech about verbal abuse. That would be an example of intensifying. Most of us know we need to watch our mouth. We need to be careful in the way that we talk to each other. So you know that, but you just need a little bit of cheerleading. You need a little bit of encouragement to intensify that belief, right? Um, the example that I gave you um, of the... Uh, uh, speech and debater, the video you watched before this lecture about um, being racially sensitive. Once again, that's a thing that most students, when I, you know, give this lecture in class, would agree we need to be racially sensitive, but they maybe has his speech intensified that belief for you. Um, this is obviously um, compared to the last thing, this is working with someone who's kind of already in favor and you're just moving them a little bit farther. It's not reasonable to think that you're going to completely change somebody's mind in the eight minutes, eight to ten minutes that you have to give the speech. It's just not reasonable. So um, think about moving them on this continuum, 
moving them on this continuum if you can. But um, as we know, maybe you've asked your parents for something for Christmas and you started working on that all the way back in August. You started dropping hints. I want a car. Hey, look at that car. Wouldn't it be nice if I had that car? And you work on that persuasion, um, you know, over time. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, so it's not reasonable for us to believe that these kind of things can happen after overnight. So this is once again a review for most of your English classes, but they're worth mentioning. Um, Aristotle gave a lecture called Rhetoric, and one of his students wrote it down. It's a really small little pamphlet. If you're going into advertising or persuasion is something, you know, speech and debate, something that really interests you, I recommend reading that short pamphlet because it's action-packed. But the pillars, the three pillars that he talks about are ethos, right? And ethos is your credibility, and we'll come right back to that. Logos is the logical appeal. So when we talk about logical fallacies um, and the foundation of um, statistics and good data that you've researched and mined, um, that is going to really be the foundation of your case. Right? I wouldn't go as a lawyer into a um, courtroom if I didn't have a DNA test, if I didn't have um, security footage. Uh, these are the things that win cases. And often these are the things that really change people's minds is logical data and logical reasoning. Um, and then pathos, which is our emotional appeals, um, pictures, uh, sentimental stories. Um, some of us, I'm a more uh, pathos-centered person. My husband is a more logo-centered person. So just depending on your personality, um, maybe your stage in life as a mother right now, you know, I cry commercials. I, I'm just a mess. So it depends on where you are uh, in order to what persuades you. But a good speech is mindful of all three of these things. I love that little meme. Uh, it cracks me up. Um, so your audience, spoiler alert, is always judging you. Your audience is always judging you. And it's good and right that they ought to judge you. Because they have gotten as far as they have. They've stayed alive by being a discerning person. So there are three different kinds of credibility that you'll have. And that is sometimes your initial credibility even before you step up to the plate, they have decided something about you. And that goes back to the first lecture about symbols. Maybe it's the way you've worn your hair. Maybe it is um, the kind of clothes that you wear. They have made decisions about you initially. Now, in our class, you have been giving these speeches from the beginning of the semester. So some of you have earned quite a bit of initial credibility. Every time you uh, walk up to that platform, every time you walk up behind that podium, the audience is excited. They can't wait to hear you speak because they've enjoyed your last five speeches, right? Uh, last four speeches. You have a certain amount of credibility with them already. When the president steps behind the podium, um, you know, he... Uh, is there by name. A lot of us have already decided how we feel about him. Um, you know, if a, a celebrity comes to an event, they already have the status of a celebrity going before them. But while you're speaking, people are sizing you up, particularly when it comes to your data. And that's why it's so important to create internal citations. You're not going to say according to the National Enquirer. You're not going to say according to to my cousin, uh, you're going to say, according to the New York Times, according to the Washington Post, uh, these, uh, according to the Atlantic, according to the Economist, you're not saying, take my word for it. You're saying, take these journalists, take these historical um, great minds, take their word for it. And so as you continue to persuade people, they're going to continue to either be dissuaded or persuaded by your credibility and by the credibility of the shoulders you stand on. And then, as we know, anytime we hear something, we go away and we mull it over and we incubate on that content and we dice it up in our mind. Um, by the end of the speech, uh, we maybe have thought something, but maybe we go away later and talk to somebody else about it and see what they think. And we continue to discern for ourselves what is good and true. 
So as I said, you're not going to change someone's mind 100% in the eight minutes. If they have never recycled anything in their life and you're trying to get them to recycle all of the things, <laughs> that might not happen. So I like to think about anytime I give a persuasion different baby steps, which would be a bronze plan. So maybe you don't recycle anything except your cans while you're on campus. Just put that can in that recycling center while you're on campus. Put the paper in the blue bins while you're on campus, all the way up to a platinum plan. Try to throw away less than one bag of garbage a week. Good luck if you have a toddler. But we try to limit our goals and think, okay, baby steps. Maybe your parents can't afford to give you a car, that new car that you want off the lot, but maybe they can buy you a used car or buy a car that you can share with your sister. So if you see that you're asking for too much, ask for less and maybe um, give people alternate uh, views and alternate choices. So we've already established that ethos is one of the historically, all the way back to ancient Greece, pillars of a good speech. This is this picture here is talking about global warming, right? Um, there are like little grandkids that will never get to play hockey. Stop global warming now, right? So it's a tug at our heartstrings. Al Gore can give us all the facts, but if we see this little baby, oh goodness, right? That maybe to the maternal people like me may do that. So one pitfall of speeches sometimes is to appeal to people's uh, boxes. I mean, by that I mean you appeal to them as a Democrat, you appeal to them as a Republican. And you have to be really careful about that because just like a joke can have inside people and outside people, it can alienate people. If you start appealing just to Christians, well, then you've um, alienated the person in the room who's not a Christian, who maybe doesn't believe in organized religion. So think about not boxing in how you appeal to people. Instead, appeal to humanity. And one of the best ways to appeal to humanity is to tap into audience values. You'll hear politicians do this a lot. They'll talk about liberty. They'll talk about the pursuit of happiness. Um, you know, if you're a libertarian, you liberty is something that you really hold up, or justice. When you talk about those big terms that everyone, most people can agree with, justice, liberty, those are values rather than um, boxes. So we talked in chapters uh, 14 and 15 about the importance of using your language and choosing your words, and that's not um, as important and informative as it is and persuasive. We really want people to have a tactile response. Right, those ASPCA commercials with Sarah McLaughlin singing Arms of an Angel, and we've got a poor little sad puppy with puppy dog eyes. Those tactile, vivid, sensory experiences pull us in emotionally and make it harder for us to close our ears. Right? Don't be afraid of furtive language. Um, if there's anywhere where shock tactics might be appropriate, it would be the opening of your persuasive speech. Now, we talked about at the beginning um, how you can abuse shock tactics. We don't want to be, um, we still want to be ethical. We don't want to show a picture of a fetus to a room full of people. Um, unfortunately, I had a little bit of trouble getting pregnant and I had to have a surgery. And that whole process before my pregnancy was a very emotionally ridden process. And um, I knew that the student was going to talk about abortion. And I, we even discussed, you know, be careful about what images you use. Um, but this particular student really shook me up when she showed a picture of a fetus uh, because I was in this process of trying to get pregnant. And so you have to be mindful. Um, some people have post-traumatic st stress disorder and loud noises or graphic images have a serious effect on them. So please be ethical in your use of emotive language or shock tactics. Um, but if anything... Um, trying to motivate somebody to get up off the couch, trying to persuade someone to do something is the time to be more emphatic. And once again, just think about Dr. Martin Luther King and um, 
his wonderful I have a dream speech, uh, their lips dripping with the words of nullification, and just that emotive, visceral quality. So the last thing that is really important, um, particularly for the persuasive speech and just reemphasizing what we've already been over, is delivery. If, um, if you are in sales, you've probably been coached to be polished, to tuck in your shirt, to wear lipstick. Those of you who are more attractive, um, almost all of the data supports that you are going to be more persuasive. If you look at our history's presidents, uh, corporate leaders, most of them are taller, they're more handsome, and they speak eloquently. Um, because there's just a certain amount of credibility derived from the way that you present yourself. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio in Wolf of Wall Street right, does a great job of presenting himself in that beautiful, beautiful suit. Um, so think about maybe for the other speeches you've worn jeans, but this speech, um, putting on your Sunday best, um, you know, combing your hair, thinking just a little bit more about how you present yourself. Now, of course, it may be that if you're a doctor, you know, you're, you're working, probably not a doctor if you're in community college, but you want to present yourself that way. Maybe you wear your scrubs to class. Uh, that's derived credibility from the way that you present yourself that way. If you're talking about tattoos, maybe you wear an outfit uh, that reveals your sleeve tattoo. So uh, credibility in the tone or area of specialization that you're presenting yourself. If I walked into a tattoo parlor to get my first tattoo and the person giving me a tattoo didn't have a tattoo, right? That credibility is not there. So obviously um, it needs to be credibility derived in the uh, appropriate way. So you can see if you haven't already got a copy of the outline that I've posted in D2L, please make sure that you uh, print that off and use it as a guide as you do with the other um, outlines you've created. Uh, one thing, one really important reason why we create outlines is to make sure that we can follow the logical flow. When I used to um, evaluate speech and debate, I'd be gone all weekend. I, a lot of what I did was flow. I would mark and create graphs of people's logic and the way that they had every claim and that every claim was well supported. So if you look at my um, outline about verbal abuse and I cite the divorce rate as as proof of verbal abuse, right? That's the evidence that supports my claim. I must also give a clear number three there, what's called a warrant. I have to show you in my logical reasoning how I think that verbal abuse is the cause of many divorces. Because if I just say, there's a, over here we have evidence of high divorce rates, obviously there's a clearer link for that and verbal abuse, you might say, well, I think that the main reason people get divorced is money, or I think the main reason people get divorced is because, uh, you know, fill in the blank. But I personally, my conviction as someone who has been married um, for a while now, since 2009, I, I think that how we talk to each other is one of the most important things about keeping our relationship healthy and um, open and communicative. And so in any case, you may give us statistical data, you may give us um, a glove, but if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit, right? The, you have to show how that evidence supports your claim, and we call that warrant. You must give us the warrant, how your evidence supports your claim. So don't only just throw a bunch of evidence at us. Don't stand up and give us a hundred statistics. You then have to take the time logically to explain to me why that statistic is evidence that supports your claim that is going to persuade us of your truth, right? You have to frame it in a context. You have to build it up and, and give a clear path of the logic because I need to always be able to flow in your logic. So as always, communication is both an art and a science, right? 
Um, one thing that is definitely tricky is refuting. So say you're going to talk about something and you know, as we've already discussed, that people in the audience don't agree with you. So maybe um, you're going to talk about something controversial and you know the person sitting in the seat next to you doesn't feel the same way that you do. Part of your technique in that situation might be to acknowledge the counterclaim and then refute it, right? To acknowledge the counterclaim and then refute it. So if I was trying to persuade you not to shop at Forever 21 because their um, clothes were built in sweatshops and I might say, you know, I might show you a picture of these people in these harsh conditions. I might show you um, a diagram of how many people in Bangladesh have died because of bad working conditions. Um, but I might take a minute to acknowledge, I know that we're poor college students. I know that it's very, clothes can be, um, you know, tw Forever 20 clothes, Forever 21 clothes are affordable. So if you take a moment to acknowledge the person's um, counter argument but then refute it uh, that sometimes can stop that conversation that they're having in their head if you if you acknowledge their point of view we have to be careful about that because if you spend too much time acknowledging the the con to your pro then that um, they could be persuaded <laughs> to, to believe the opposite so always make sure that your refutations are short and to the point <clears throat> and you spend most of the time building your own case rather than knocking someone else's down. Remember the persuasive is a time for you to say your truth not just refuting the other side. So we're going to go over some logical fallacies. These are things that you probably covered in your English class so I'll move relatively quickly. So hopefully you watched the Freakonomics video at the beginning about the ties between polio and ice cream and how ice cream was banned in the summer. <laughs> um, Freakonomics is one of my favorite uh, podcasts to listen to. They have a book, they have a documentary. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. Um, and it has to do a lot of what Freakonomics is about is what does the data say versus common opinion. And um, I read another book recently um, that called them bloodletting awards because <laughs> right the, the, this practice that doctors used to have of bloodletting and there wasn't a lot of science to po support bloodletting but people were fooled by it and I'm sure there are things 20 years from now that people look back and laugh at us that wasn't logical that wasn't helpful um, but as much as we can we want to look at um, chronology we want to look at causation uh, versus correlation so if you go into the doctor and he asks you, um, you know, what are your symptoms? And you say, I have a runny nose. And he's trying to discern if this is a cold or allergies. They start asking you all of these really um, suspect questions, right? Very direct questions because they're trying to get down to the truth. And this is a logical reasoning process. And if what's making my nose run is the pollen, that's one set of medications and if what's making my nose run is a bug right then he's gonna give me an antibiotic so they're trying to get down to the root of the problem and once we find that root of the problem and get rid of that root we eliminate the problem maybe you're a classroom teacher and you have a disruptive class that's just sort of combative and frustrated and um, you think it's this one student but when you get that student kicked out of the class, the class is still super disruptive and not productive. And you've had what we would call a scapegoat. You were blaming it all on this person. Well, maybe they're not the root of the problem. We got to get down to the root of the problem. And post hoc ergo proctor pro. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Let me try that again. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. That's Latin. Um, and it means this then, right? Causality. This, obviously, then. So, ergo, you might hear that if you watch courtroom dramas, ergo, right? They're saying this, ergo, that. Uh, and so, sometimes we can clearly identify the root problem, but not always. And sometimes we think we have the root of the problem. Sometimes we think uh, it's a virus and we take that antibiotic and it doesn't go away. Sometimes we think it is the rats. Well, when the plague, we turned, we found out that it was actually the lice that were on the rats. So 
we blamed the rats. It wasn't really the rat's fault for the Black Plague. But getting at the root of the problem is a really um, important part of logical reasoning. And sometimes it can be easy to oversimplify a false root. If we look at um, obesity in America, there's a higher obesity rate in rural areas than urban areas. So um, even though you know, I currently live uh, in Tullahoma, Tennessee. Um, I was raised in a rural environment. And so if I look at, okay, what are the reasons for this obesity epidemic uh, in my home? Um, well, it could be our, the availability of fresh produce. That's something that has been um, thought that maybe people who are in an urban environment may have more readily, I mean, they can go over to Whole Foods and grab something real quick. Uh, whereas I have to drive 30 minutes to Winchester to get uh, fresh produce if I live in Cowan. Whereas if I stop at the Dollar General, there's, you know, a Snickers bar already cellophane wrapped and it's going to stay good. Well, we also know that people in rural environments are often not as wealthy as people in urban environments and that that Snickers bar is only a dollar but it's three dollars for a bagged salad so we look at the cost maybe the correlation between obesity and uh, or rural environments has to do with cost maybe it has to do with proximity or lastly maybe it has to do with tradition Right? I showed you a picture of my healthy dad at the beginning of this. He gets up every morning and makes biscuits because that's what his mother did. Uh, so when we look at what is the cause for this obesity, um, we see many causes. And we don't, we, we would not presume to say this is the root cause, it's tradition. This is the root cause, it's proximity. This is the root cause um, because there seems to be just a correlation and a whole gunshot approach to all of these. I mean, all of these contribute to obesity, but it's not necessarily a root cause. So be careful anytime you think someone is speaking so emphatically and saying this is the root cause because they're probably looking for a scapegoat. Check your relationship between A and B. Is it proximity to obesity? Uh, you know, what is this correlation? So the second one of our logical fallacies is a slippery slope. Now a slippery slope is not necessarily a fallacy. So say my son, um, you know, 15 years from now and he's going out on a, uh, to a party with some friends and I say, um, if you stay out past curfew, then you're going to do drugs and if you get drugs and you're going to get a girl pregnant and if you get a girl pregnant then you're going to have to drop out of school and you're going to be uh, homeless for the rest of your life in a gutter so make sure you're home by 11. Right, I have gone down a cause and effect I've said because then obviously that ergo that ergo that now he really might end up homeless if he stays out too late but it's presumptive I'm I am pretending like I can see the future right um, James Dobson famously said a few years ago that if we let if we legalize uh, gay marriage then next thing you know we'll be legalizing bestiality uh, if you don't know bestiality is um, sexual relations with animals uh, that is what we in argumentation would call a slippery slope right if that, then obviously this. It's not not particularly true, right? Um, so, another common fallacy is just distraction. We call that a red herring approach. If um, English fox hunters, in order to train their foxes, um, uh, sorry, not their foxes, they would train their hounds to chase foxes. So one of the common techniques that these um, fox hunters would do in training their hounds to chase foxes is rub a herring. A herring is a smelly, smelly fish and they would rub it along a path and they would teach the hound not to chase the herring. Now I have dogs, two dogs, and they love anything smelly. They want to roll around in it, they want to waller in that smelly, smelly thing. So it takes quite a bit of training for a hound not to chase the smelly thing, but to keep their eyes on the prize, which is the fox. So 
anytime we just try distraction techniques. Um, you know, if we look at, um, say I'm washing the dishes and I come in, um, my husband comes in from work and I say, why didn't you wash these dishes? And he says, your hair looks so pretty today. And I go off on a tangent about my hair. He's effectively red herring to me. Instead of, he's avoided that fight about the dishes by complimenting my hair. And um, sometimes when politicians are asked a direct question, they will start talking about something else to try to distract the attention away from the direct question they don't want to ask. And that's called a red herring. We need to say, could you please answer the question? So another thing that um, is false, another fallacy, we're, we're going over five, so we're almost to the end here, is either or. So someone might say um, either this or that, and they try to make it black and white and deny all of the gray that's in between. So I have here a balancing scale between the money and the earth. Um, some people would say that if we're going to do these earth-friendly things, it's going to cost us a lot of money. But that's not necessarily true, right? Some green practices, such as um, not throwing uh, away my containers and reusing them as long as they don't have BPA in them, uh, that actually saves me money. I don't have to pay for the Tupperware. If I look at my dad's refrigerator, it's got all those margarine uh, or Cool Whip containers full of leftovers because he's cheap. He's been saving money um, by also being good to the earth. So it's sometimes people, um, the, this is also the false dilemma of us versus them, right? Us versus them. Um, well, sometimes there's room for both of us at the table. So saying it's you or me, you know, that competitive nature isn't always true because sometimes um, there's gray in between. Sometimes there's room for both of us at the table. So sometimes we create a dilemma. We create a alienation, a polarization when there's not, right? When there's not really, there's a lot more common ground there than we think. So last one is attacking the man, not the argument. Now I began this lecture by talking about derived credibility and how um, your credibility as a speaker is a big part of people's acceptance of what you're saying. You represent the idea as a person. Um, so when we look at a political campaign, well, the most recent one I think is easy, um, you know, Hillary versus Trump, when all of these, um, you know, email scandal came out right before the election, we know that had a huge influence on the outcome of the election because we're attacking the woman who stands for all of these things she's running for. And even though most of us would like to say, well, we vote according to policy, we vote according to our beliefs, not necessarily for a person, but for an ideal, the hurting of that person affects, I mean, we're only human. So um, if you're in a debate with someone and you say, oh yeah, well, you're wearing an ugly tie, that doesn't seem relevant to the logic. Um, uh, you know, famously, uh, about 10 years ago, oh yeah, well, your um, daughter's a lesbian <laughs> was one that came out during the debates uh, between vice presidents, and he, he stood for family values. Oh yeah, well, your daughter's a lesbian. Well, there was many things wrong with that comment, but the least of which is it has nothing to do with policy. His daughter's life choice uh, doesn't have anything to do with his policies towards family practices. So, in general, we want to avoid, and when we're giving logical, sound, um, reliable evidence, we want to avoid attacking people. Usually only just makes you look like a jerk. Some other things we say, this is how we've always done it. Uh, you know, I'm sure things like bloodletting, that's why they kept on so long, is because that's the way it's always been done. Um, it is good and right for things to change and evolve. Um, so, you know, when I see politicians who, uh, actors who try to speak to political things, it's, you know, it's almost embarrassing often, uh, because just because someone's famous doesn't mean they're an expert. Just because someone has credibility in one area, you know, just because he's a doctor doesn't mean he can speak to politics. So what is their expertise in the area that they're speaking to, right? Um, another common, you know, is the bandwagon. Everybody else is doing it. Everybody else believes it, so it must be true. But unfortunately, we know time and time again, especially when we get a mob mentality, just because other people believe it doesn't mean it's true. Now, 
if you have a um, speech topic that you know nobody supports you in, I'd like to challenge you not to say that. Because even though the bandwagon is not logical, it's by far the most effective because we're only human beings. We're herd animals. <laughs> we want to go where the tribe is going. We want to follow the flow. And so if you are doing something, you say, I know everybody vaccinates their children, but I want to tell you why you shouldn't. That's a really um, bad way to start your speech. Uh, the least of which is because vaccinations have saved lives and I would not let you get that topic. But so uh, you have to choose a topic now and hopefully at this point in the semester you have kind of mulled over lots of topics and we've already sort of been talking about this throughout the semester um, but you have to create what's called a proposition now that's a big fancy word that we see thrown around in policy a lot uh, you know particularly as it pertains to government I have here a little picture of Prop 8, which you may be familiar with going on in California. Um, but you have to choose a proposition, right? You have to, there are three different kinds of propositions, fact, value, and policy. Um, and you may be a little bit confused by that term fact. Well, um, you think fact versus opinion. It's something that you probably studied in elementary school. This is a fact. This is an opinion. Um, but as we've seen over and over, facts are debatable. If I have one contractor come in and tell me the cost of my home, I could put that down as a fact. But then if I have another contractor come in who's also certified, he could say a different number. So just because it is a fact doesn't mean it's not still debatable. Um, but that is asserting a truth. Uh, a value um, is asserting the worth of something. So if you were to give a speech about how we ought to um, have every state do something kind of like the Tennessee problem, promise and pay for uh, education, education ought to be free in America, you're asserting the value of higher education and you are um, trying to get us to assert it even more, trying to get us to grow in our appreciation of it. So you're taking something, maybe you value human life, maybe you value literacy in children, and you're trying to um, ingrain us with that. So lastly is policy. And this is the magic word for policy is should, right? Um, you should um, spay or neuter your pets. You should um, legalize marijuana, right? Policy. What ought we do. So on your um, persuasive speech you need to have a clear proposition. This is not the time for informative information or a pro and a con. You have an opinion and you're trying to assert it with us. All right, so that is the end of the lecture for today. Um, I know you have lots of questions and I know that this is a really hard time of year so please come see me if you need help kind of sorting out your topics or if you're looking for a good topic. Uh, the scope of your topic is something I see a lot with the persuasive speech.